Hi everyone, this lesson is on Marfan syndrome. So Marfan syndrome is a genetic condition involving systemic connective tissue changes. So it's going to lead to a large variety of different clinical features, including changes to body shape. It'll also cause issues with the eyes, heart, and lungs. We'll discuss all this in more detail as we go through this lesson. Marfan syndrome is caused by a mutation in the FBN1 gene, and this gene encodes for a protein known as fibrillin-1. And this particular gene, FBN1, is located on chromosome 15. So a way to remember this is by the letter F. FBN1, fibrillin, and chromosome 15. Now, Marfan syndrome is an autosomal dominant condition, meaning that we only need one affected allele in order to have this condition. So Oftentimes, an affected child will have at least one affected parent. And what's interesting about Marfan syndrome is that it has complete penetrance, meaning that if you have an affected allele, if you have a mutation in FBN1, you will have signs and symptoms of Marfan syndrome, but it will have variable expressivity, meaning that different people with Marfan syndrome will have different signs and symptoms. Some will have more signs and symptoms than others, some will have fewer, and some will have very different than others. So it can appear as different signs and symptoms even in the same family. A affected parent might have certain signs and symptoms different than the child. So this is an interesting point to make note of here. Now, Marfan syndrome is relatively a common genetic condition and incidence is estimated at 1 in 3,000 to 5,000. And although we mentioned that an affected child may have an affected parent, and that occurs in about 75% of cases, 25% of cases of Marfan syndrome are due to what we call de novo mutations, meaning that they are brand new mutations in that particular generation. So the child will be born with a mutation in FBN1, but their parent didn't have it. So it's a new mutation, a de novo mutation. Now let's discuss some of the pathophysiology behind what happens in Marfan syndrome. So as mentioned before, it's going to be due to a mutation in FBN1 gene, which encodes for fibrillin 1. So it's going to lead to either reduced levels of fibrillin-1 or a reduced functionality of fibrillin-1. So it's important to know what fibrillin-1 does. So fibrillin-1 is going to have important roles in connective tissue, and connective tissue is found all through the body. And more specifically, it's going to aid in supporting elastin. So elastin is going to be something that allows for tissues to be able to be stretched, but also to snap back into their place. So any tissue, like the skin for instance, has elastin in it. If you were to pull on the skin, it will go back. And we can see this in other tissues as well, including the lungs. So we're going to find fibrillin in places where elastin is located. And we're going to find it in places like microfibrils. So microfibrils are going to have these fibrillin proteins sort of dotted throughout the fibrils. And Fibrillin-1 is a matrix glycoprotein, and it allows for scaffolding and proper organization of elastin. So elastin can sort of use it to bind and form a proper structure. So it, again, stabilizes and supports elastin. It aids in proper elastin assembly, and it promotes elastin tensile strength. So if we don't have fibrillin-1, we're not going to have proper elastin functionality we're going to lose that ability of elastin to operate properly. And elastin can be found in many different places, again, as we mentioned before. And this is going to lead to issues in places like the lungs. As mentioned before, elastin is located in the lungs. It's going to affect places like the skin. It can also affect the arteries and veins. It's going to be found in the musculoskeletal system. And it's also going to be found in the eyes as well. So all these bodily systems are going to be affected in Marfan syndrome. We'll discuss all the details of the signs and symptoms as we go through this lesson. And fibrillin 1 has another important function in that it suppresses TGF beta or tumor growth factor beta. So it reduces its level. And this is important because TGF beta is involved in tissue growth. It's involved in inflammation. It's involved in activating metalloproteinases. And it's involved in fibrosis as well. So if we lose fibrillin 1, we're going to have too much activity of TGF beta and we're going to have too much tissue growth. This can lead to some of those body habitus changes we'll talk about here in a moment. And this can also lead to issues with fibrosis and also inappropriate activation of metalloproteinases and especially metalloproteinases 2 and 9. These will be important 
in some of the issues that will be found in the heart. Now let's discuss the signs and symptoms of Marfan syndrome. We'll break it down into bodily system. So we'll first talk about the musculoskeletal system because this is where we'll see a lot of the clinical features of Marfan syndrome. So one of the clinical features of Marfan syndrome is a long slender body. So this is termed as a Marfan body habitus. So we'll see very tall individuals, very thin, and we'll also see long arms and long legs as well. And it's often going to be long arms to trunk length. So the arms will be very long and they will reach even far beyond the trunk. And these long arms and long legs is termed dolicostenomelia. We can also see scoliosis as well. So scoliosis is where the curvature of the spine is altered. I and mean, you can think of it as sort of in an S shape. So it's sort of twisted. We can also see what we call arachnodactyly. So arachnodactyly is actually long fingers, very long fingers, and we can also see long toes as well. So this is going to be something we can often see in patients with Marfan syndrome. And this leads to particular clinical tests that can be performed on patients. One of them is what we call the wrist sign. So if you were to have a patient that you suspect has Marfan syndrome and they were to use their opposing hand and sort of wrap it around their opposite wrist, the wrist sign is when they can easily overlap their fifth finger, their pinky finger, with their thumb on the opposite hand or the opposite wrist. So that would be the wrist sign. And we can also see what we call the, the thumb sign as well. So normally if a patient were to make a fist with their thumb inside their fingers, there's no overlap or there's no time when the thumb is sticking out. But in Marfan syndrome, because their fingers are so long, they can have their thumb actually sticking out here. So that would be the thumb sign. So we can see wrist sign and thumb sign in Marfan syndrome. We can also see important chest wall deformities. Some of these include pectus excavatum. So this is what pectus excavatum looks like. You can remember it by thinking that the chest has been excavated. So there's an internal or inner sort of depression in the chest. And we can also see something called pectus carinatum. So pectus carinatum is where the chest points out, and this can often be referred to as a pigeon chest. So these can be found in Marfan syndrome as well. We can also see other musculoskeletal findings, including high arch palate in the mouth, dental crowdings. So many of their teeth look like they're crowding each other. They can have downward slanting eyes and flat feet or pes planus. They can have joint hypermobility. They can have what we call protrusio acetabuli. They can also have certain dermatological findings, including striae or stretch marks. They can also have pulmonary findings, so findings in the lungs. These include the fact that they're at a higher risk of having spontaneous pneumothorax. So this is where one of the lungs collapses. And this is due to apical blebs. So the lung apex is at the top here. This is the lung base. So the lung apex is up here. Often going to have these sort of bulges out on the lung where part of the lung becomes a bit weakened and in some cases those blebs can rupture and they can have a collapsed lung because of it. And Marfan syndrome patients will have important cardiac findings and these include mitral valve prolapse. About 50% of patients with Marfan syndrome will have mitral valve prolapse. So if you look in this diagram here, here is the right side of the heart, here is the left side of the heart, this is the right atrium, the right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle, and the mitral valve is going to be the valve between the left atrium and the left ventricle. So it's this valve right here, and mitral valve prolapse will be where these two leaflets of the valve will actually pop back in toward the left atrium. And this will lead to particular murmur, and it's going to be a systolic murmur, and it's going to have a particular characteristic in that it has a mid-systolic click. So it's going to occur after S1. S1 is that lub sound, and S2 is the dub sound. So S1 would be when the tricuspid and mitral valve close. So S1 is the sound of the tricuspid valve and the mitral valve closing. Once they close, that's systole, and then 
there's going to be S2 sound, that's the dub sound. This is when pulmonic valve and the aortic valve, so these two valves here, when they close. And after S2, then we're in diastole, when the heart is filling back up with blood. So this mitral valve prolapse is going to occur during systole, and it's going to be a mid-systolic click, so it's going to be right in the middle of that lub and dub sound. So when your heart beats, lub dub, lub dub, it's going to occur right in between that lub and dub. There's going to be a click, and then there's going to be this murmur, and we're going to hear it generally stop at the dub sound, the S2. So that's a mitral valve prolapse, and this can ultimately lead to mitral regurgitation. Aortic regurgitation can also occur as well. So here's the aortic valve. So this is where the left ventricle is pumping blood. It pumps it through the aortic valve into the aorta. And what's supposed to happen is the aortic valve is supposed to close so blood doesn't flow back into the left ventricle. But in aortic regurgitation, there can be some blood that actually flows back into the left ventricle. So this can lead to an early diastolic murmur. So it's going to occur right around the time where you hear that dub sound, that S2 sound. So again, that's when the pulmonic and aortic valves close. We're going to get the murmur, the aortic regurgitation murmur occurring right around that time. So that is going to be something that can also be found in Marfan syndrome as well. And this is often going to be described as a high-pitched blowing murmur. Importantly, we can also see aortic root dilatation in Marfan syndrome. So the aortic root, so right in around this area here, starts to increase in size. It gets dilated, again, because of changes to the structure of elastin and other surrounding structures. So we can get dilatation of the aortic root or the aorta. We can also get an aortic aneurysm. And then we can also have increased risk of aortic dissection, where there's essentially a break, a full thickness break through the aortic wall, and that's basically where the aorta becomes dissected. So that can be a risk for Marfan syndrome patients, and this is often what will lead to lethality in patients with Marfan syndrome, especially ones that are not treated. And then another important finding in the heart that we can see with Marfan syndrome is cystic medial aortic necrosis. This is going to be a finding where there's necrosis in one of the layers of the aorta, the tunica media specifically. So this layer, this middle layer of the aorta is affected. So this is a finding in Marfan syndrome, cystic medial aortic necrosis. And we can also find important ophthalmological or eye findings in Marfan syndrome as well. Marfan syndrome patients are at a higher risk for having early cataracts. They are also at a higher risk for having myopia or having nearsightedness. They're also at a higher risk for having retinal detachment. So this is where the retina essentially detaches from the back of the eye. And when this happens, there can be flashes of light, there can be floaters all of a sudden. So this can be potential findings in Marfan syndrome. And then another important finding is lens dislocation. So because of the fact that we're missing fibrillin, we're missing the scaffolding of elastin, we're losing some of the supporting structures for certain structures in the eye. And one of them is the lens. So we can get lens dislocation in patients who have Marfan syndrome. And it's going to occur in a certain way. It's going to be dislocated upward and outward. So up and out. And a way to remember that it goes up and out is that Marfan fans out. So that's a way to remember that there is this lens dislocation. Now, how do clinicians diagnose Marfan syndrome? So genetic testing is going to be important. So FBN1 mutations will be found in most patients, not all, but most. Clinical diagnosis is often going to be used based on particular morphological characteristics and based on a particular diagnostic criteria known as revised Gantt criteria. The Gantt criteria is a scoring system. It has many different features. It essentially lists out all the features we talked about in this lesson and then scores them. So some of the findings we could see with the Gantt criteria include FBN1 mutation, aortic root dilatation or dissection, lens dislocation, morphological changes like wrist sign, thumb sign, pest planus or flat-footedness, hind foot valgus, chest wall deformities, etc., and other findings like normothorax, but there are many others. If you want more information, please look up the Gantt criteria. It's important as part of the diagnostic routine for patients who have Marfan syndrome to do 
echocardiography and to do it regularly. So we want to make sure that we're keeping an eye on the aortic root. Eye exams are also going to be important as well. So having regular eye exams because of that risk for lens dislocation. So using a slit lamp to check the lens. And then it can also be important to exclude other connective tissue disorders as well, including Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And because of the risk of death in patients who have Marfan syndrome, early diagnosis is going to improve outcomes dramatically for these patients. Once a clinician has made the diagnosis, how do they treat Marfan syndrome? So there's no cure for this condition because it's a genetic condition, but the key is to prevent complications. Because of the fact that there's a decreased life expectancy in Marfan syndrome patients, due to cardiac complications. Again, some of those include that risk of aortic dissection. That can be a very important risk for patients who have Marfan syndrome, and it's going to be very especially important in those who are not diagnosed and treated. So there's going to be certain things we can do to lower the risk of cardiovascular complications. These include avoidance of vigorous exercise in these patients. Beta blockers are important as well. These reduce the risk of cardiac complications. Putting patients on low sartan as well, this is an angiotensin receptor blocker. This has been found to suppress TGF beta levels. And then also surgical repair of the aorta is gonna be important here. And there's a particular procedure for repairing the aorta and that's known as the Bentle procedure. And then with regards to ophthalmological findings, if there is a lens dislocation, artificial lens replacement is going to be important. If there's cataract, then a cataract surgery is going to be important. So a lot of times it's going to be focusing on the cardiovascular because this is where we're going to have that increased mortality in patients with Marfan syndrome. So once we do this, we keep an eye on the aorta and the size of the aorta especially. And if need be, then there's going to be surgical repair of the aorta that is performed and has very good outcomes. So those are going to be some of the most important factors of treatment in Marfan syndrome. And then the other ones, if there are other issues that occur, they can be dealt with accordingly. Please check out some of my other lessons on conditions like methemoglobinemia for more information on that topic. Please also consider joining as a member for members only content. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thanks so much for watching and hope to see you again soon.